prophecies have foretold, and wisdom keepers all know, that the rise of the feminine will restore balance to our world. In this podcast, we are on a journey to understand the root of the imbalance that has caused disconnection and dysfunction within our humanity, so we can emerge as leaders, creating a new story on Earth. I'm Lauren Walsh. And I'm Shayna Connors. With humble hearts and open minds, we will converse with spiritual teachers, historians, psychologists, revolutionaries, leaders, and healers to navigate these evolving times and reintegrate the feminine history that we have forgotten. Welcome to the Time of the Feminine podcast. Welcome, Elizabeth, the Time of the Feminine podcast. It's great to be here. I am really excited to dive into the root of how we got into the situation where the feminine was not only oppressed, but feared, demonized. And if I would love to approach it from the lens of your scholarship and your expertise, would you like to share a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um would you like me to talk about how I got into it or what my I work say is known let's, for? <laughs> let's let's talk about how you got into it and then what your work is known for. You can give us a little bit of a journey. Okay, great. So um, for a really long time, I was a professional musician. I was a singer-songwriter. I lived in both L.A. and New York. And I did that for like 10 or 12 years. And um, a lot of fun things happened in that time. Um, and at a certain point, I was sort of getting a little bit burnt out on the music business because it's not that fun in the long run. <laughs> and um, around that time, I wrote a song kind of out of the blue about Mary Magdalene, which really surprised me because I'm kind of like a pop rock singer songwriter. I don't write Christian music or anything like that. So I was like, why did I write a song about a saint? And um, because I wrote the song, I decided to start researching Mary Magdalene and just find out about her as a total lay person. And um, I went to the Brooklyn Public Library. I lived in New York at this time. And I went to uh, check out The Complete Idiot's Guide to Mary Magdalene. And in the after reading that book, I just I was still interested. And I had this funny thought. I was thinking, I wonder if there was anything changed around Mary Magdalene in the Gospels. And so I got this crazy idea um, as a total lay person who had no training in Greek or Latin or anything like that. Um, I was just like, you know, maybe I, I want to look at the world's oldest copy of the Gospel of John because that's the, the Gospel where she's featured the most prominently. And um, when I basically I found out that the world's oldest copy of John is Papyrus 66 which is usually thought to have been copied around 200 AD. And so when I found out about this papyrus, I was trying to look at it and it's really hard to get to look at it. You can't just, you know, look it up like, oh, what does papyrus 66 say? I had to sort of talk to a friend of my childhood parish priest who pointed me to an academic who lived in Manhattan at that time. Her name was Dr. Deirdre Good. And um, she was a professor at General Theological Seminary of the Episcopal Church. And so I got coffee with Deirdre. And I said, I really want to look at Papyrus 66. And so she very kindly sent me a link to an online transcription of this manuscript. This is back in 2012. And I was like, OK, um, OK, what does it say? And it was all in Greek. I was like, uh, and like I don't I don't read Greek. Didn't somebody translate this? I thought this was the world's oldest copy of the Gospel of John. But that's not actually how it works. People translate critical editions. You know, people look at hundreds, if not thousands of manuscripts, and they kind of like cobble together what they think the correct text is in Greek. And that is what gets translated. So you don't always know about different manuscripts saying different things. So I was I was able to get this uh, transcription of Papyrus 66. And um, I guess I was just really diligent or maybe this is like a clue that I should maybe be an academic because I didn't give up. I was like, OK, I can use an interlinear study Bible and I can like have two windows open on my computer. One window has 
this transcription of Papyrus 66. And then the other window, I can look at every single Greek word and see what it means and see if it's different. So I was really dorking out here. I mean, being a little bit obsessive, really, honestly. Um, And I basically, I started in John 20, of course. That's the scene between Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the garden in John's gospel. And everything in Papyrus 66 looks like it said what your Bible said. Okay. Then I go to John 19, the scene at the cross. Okay. Still says everything that your Bible is supposed to say. But from the complete idiot's guide to Mary Magdalene, I had heard that some people thought that Mary of Bethany, that is the sister of Lazarus, the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead in John chapter 11, some people thought that that was Mary Magdalene. So I'm like, well, I should check there too. I was like about to give up. I was like, I guess I was wrong. There's nothing, you know, just trust the scholars. They know what they're doing. And then I looked at John 11 in this papyrus and you could see that it has all these crossings out. Like for five verses solid, you know, the name Mary had been crossed out a few times. I was like, whoa, I was like, what is going on here? And I I could basically figure out that the name Mary had been changed to Martha in verse one. And in verse three, the name Mary had been crossed out and all the verbs had been changed from singular to plural. And then there was a few other changes that I didn't understand because I didn't know Greek, but I could figure out the basics. And so I said this transcription of John 11 to Deirdre Good. And I said, look at this. And she she was like, oh, very interesting. And I was like, come on, like, this might be Mary Magdalene. You know, people have thought that Lazarus's sister Mary was Mary Magdalene. And look, this Mary's getting crossed out. And she didn't really have too strong of a response. And I, I think that uh, now looking back on it, I think that it was probably because Um, that papyrus was found in the 1950s and it was first published in 1958 and scholars commented on it in the 1960s. And so you would think that if there was something important, I mean, that was like 50 years previous, you would think that somebody would have done something about it. (laughs) Right. It's kind of unbelievable to think that uh, noticed. It, I mean, basically, I was able to get some of the peer-reviewed articles that were published in the 1960s, and they're like, yep, the name Mary's been crossed out. Like, yep, a woman's been split in two. That's the weirdest change in the whole manuscript. And that was the end. Nobody did anything. And I was like, what? And so I tried to, like, send it to the fancy scholars. Like, I think I sent it to Karen King and to Elaine Peggles. And I was just like, you got to do something about this. And um, they were just busy. And they, I, it's just not really their specialty. I didn't also really understand this. They more do like Nag Hammadi, which is sort of the Gnostic Gospels kind of stuff. They're not so much text critics of the New Testament. And as time went on, I would learn that the people who are textual critics of the New Testament are like 95% conservative white males. And they're really smart. I mean, and some of these are like really, I mean, I've met them all now and they are men of integrity and I trust them to make good ethical decisions. It's just that when they see a woman's name crossed out a few times, it doesn't like cause any kind of weird reaction from them. They're just like, oh, a mistake. Like they didn't they don't have the visceral response that I did. And and to me, that's just like you really need diversity. You really need diversity in this guild. You can't literally have every single person determining what the Greek words of the New Testament are to be 100 percent like mostly European white men. You can't do that. So anyway, the point is. I realized, okay, nobody's doing anything. And I sent it to the people who are supposed to be doing something and they're not doing anything either. If I don't do something, nobody's going to do anything. So um, my best friend, Kelly, said to me, Libby, you can't keep um, harassing these like top tier scholars like they've got jobs and students. They have to grade papers, you know, like you're just some rando (laughs) sending them stuff like you have to do. You have to go get a, a degree. And I was like, but then I have to learn Greek. That sounds like the worst imaginable thing. Like I'm a singer songwriter. I don't want to learn Greek. And so I kind of hemmed and hawed for maybe a year. And then finally, in 2013, I enrolled in a master's program to study with Deirdre um, at General Theological Seminary. So I just moved from Brooklyn to Manhattan. And 
that I was like, okay, I'm going to learn Greek. I'm going to write a master's thesis on Papyrus 66. And then, of course, when you, once you enter a master's program, you learn lots of new things. And I learned the importance of the patristic record, like what did Hippolytus of Rome say in the third century? What did Tertullian say? What did Irenaeus say? Because those, they had a different, they had a second or a third century copy of John's gospel in front of them. And they were talking about their second or third century copy. And sometimes they say something that like doesn't match what your Bible said. So you're like, oh, that's important. Um, and then somebody else, one of the other professors said, have you looked at the Vetus Latina? I'm like, what are the Vetus Latina? <laughs> and it's basically um, these old Latin manuscripts of the Gospels that were translated from Greek into Latin in the second or the third century before. Or St. Jerome did this sort of standard Latin translation that's called the Vulgate. So these old Latin copies were translated from second or third century Greek copies. Anyway, the point is, I wrote this master's thesis, and I ended up looking at over 100 transcriptions of the Gospel of John, mainly from that website that Deirdre had originally sent me to. And I found that the name Mary was crossed out and changed to Martha, like, all over the place. Or some manuscripts, Mary would be doing something where your Bible would say that Martha was doing it. Or it would say that one sister was doing something where your Bible would say that there was two. And I actually found out that you can reconstruct most of the chapter of John 11 using real manuscripts. Like real manuscripts of John, you just take this verse from this manuscript, this verse from this manuscript, this verse from this manuscript, like crossed out readings. And you can get a different version of the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead with only Lazarus and Mary, no Martha. Interesting. Can you tell me what that story would, how that would go? Yes, I absolutely can. So, I mean, if people want to open a Bible, I don't know if these the people on your podcast have Bibles, but if, or it's probably on your phone, just go to John 11. This is the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. It will say something different in your Bible than what I'm about to say. So if you look at the crossed out readings in Papyrus 66, Codex Alexandrinus and Codex Colbertinus, and you put them together, you get this alternate opening to the story. Um, maybe I'll say what it usually says if for people yeah, who don't want to open great. their Bible. Yeah. So what, what your Bible would usually say is there was a certain sick man, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, the one you love is sick. But when Jesus heard, he said, this illness is not unto death, but it is for the glory of God in order to glorify the son through it, or maybe the son of God through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. That's what your Bible would say. But if you look at these crossed out readings in Papyrus 66 and Codex Alexandrinus, which is like a fifth century copy, and Codex Colbertinus, which is an old Latin copy, um, you get this other reading that would say, there is a certain sick man, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, his sister. Now, this is the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, Mary sent to him saying, Lord, behold, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard, he said to her, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God in order to glorify the son through it. Now Jesus loved Lazarus and his sister. That is different. I have chills. So, okay. There's so much to dive into, but the, the most pressing question for me is why, what can you conclude is the reason for this change? Well, that's pretty important. <laughs> well, so if you if you kind of step back, if you like pull back and you look at, John chapter 11, the story of the raising of Lazarus, you have to say, okay, so what is Martha's primary role? Um, and I should also mention that there's another gospel story in a different gospel, gospel of Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, where Jesus goes, he's, he's not in Bethany at this point. Bethany's kind of just outside Jerusalem in the South. In Luke's gospel, he visits the home of Martha and Mary. And at this point, he's in the North. He's in Galilee or Samaria. And Martha is busy and distracted with much service. And her sister Mary is sitting at Jesus's feet. 
and listening. And Martha complains and Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're busy and distracted with many things. Only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better part and it will not be taken away from her. So Jesus kind of says, Mary's listening to, you know, the wisdom that I have to offer. Martha, you're distracted with all these tasks. <clears throat> but what's and so everybody assumes, I mean, any Christian on the planet will assume that Luke is talking about the same sisters that John is talking about. But some commentators notice they're like, wait a second. First of all, Mary and Martha are in Luke's gospel. They're not in Bethany. They're in the north. Totally different location. Second of all, they don't have a brother. It's just Martha and Mary in Luke's gospel. And a few commentators actually, really excellent commentators, people like John P. Meyer and Robert Fortner. I mean, sometimes these hardcore Catholic Bible scholars are like really good at what they do. And uh, John P. Meyer in his book, uh, a marginal Jew had said, oh, maybe the original story of Lazarus only had Lazarus and Mary. So he, but he had said that not based on any manuscripts. He was just noticing that there was something kind of funny about the Lazarus story. And, and also that um, in the Lazarus story, both Mary and Martha go out to greet Jesus and they say this identical quote. Martha goes out first and she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And Mary goes out afterward. And she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. So it's like this identical quote. And that's kind of a flag for biblical scholars. Oh, something might have been doubled here. So people had already sort of theorized that a sister was doubled. And so people like Meyer and Fortna and Gerard Rocher, like some people before, had said, oh, there's Martha might have been doubled, but they weren't looking at those manuscripts. And so um, if you but the thing that Martha does that is the very most important in John's gospel is that Jesus is talking like she says, if you've been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says, basically, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? Have you heard that before? Does, does that kind of ring a bell? I am the resurrection and the life. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty famous quote. But did you know who Jesus was talking to? I thought Lazarus. No, I mean, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> okay. Martha then? I don't know his sister. He is, he is talking to Martha. Yeah, but Martha's kind of forgettable. I mean, everybody knows that Jesus says that quote, but I would say that nine out of 10 Christians would not know who he's talking to. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's because the character he's talking to is kind of forgettable. I only and so know Martha based on a, not a biblical, not reading the Bible, but of a, kind of a, an imaginary interpretation about the situation oh. that was beautiful where they mentioned Martha. Yeah, I mean, she's, I mean, because then she goes on to say, what is the thesis statement of the Gospel of John? She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. So, you know, people who pay attention to the Gospel of John, they're like, yeah, this Martha character is kind of minor, but don't forget about Martha because she happens to say the central thesis statement of the entire Gospel. And it's like, okay. So what would it mean if Martha were not there? And what's really funny, I was talking about the importance of looking at what church fathers had written. One of the earliest church fathers to write about the Gospel of John, Tertullian, Tertullian of Carthage, he was kind of a misogynist, like he was kind of grumpy, very grumpy. Um, he wrote this treatise called Against Praxius, like where he was like defending Christianity to this guy named Praxius. And in like 210 AD, around the same time Papyrus 66 was copied, in fact, he says that Mary gave the Christological confession. Ooh. So in Tertullian's copy, which is probably a second century copy of John's gospel, Mary is the one who confesses, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. The thesis statement of the gospel of John. So and the so reason this... Yeah, go ahead. It's significant why for those of us who have no idea. Because um, as far back, certainly as the third or possibly even the second century, people thought that Mary Magdalene was Lazarus's sister. So if people are reading a gospel of John where Mary says, yes, Lord, I believe, like Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And Mary says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God. Then that makes her possibly Mary Magdalene that says this, that the central thesis statement of the Gospel of John. 
And then it means that she's like one unified character throughout the entire second half of this gospel. It means that she confesses Jesus is the Christ. Then in the next chapter, she anoints Jesus Mm. um, at the supper. And then Mary Magdalene stands by Jesus at the cross. This is all John's gospel. So I'm not trying to talk about like the history of like who was at the cross or who anointed Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about John's presentation of the events. I'm saying that John may have tried to present Mary Magdalene as the Christological confessor and the anointer. And then she's standing at the foot of the cross. And then Jesus appears to her and only her in the garden on Easter morning. John is the gospel where there's this encounter between Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the garden. And then he commissions her to go and announce his resurrection. So the thing is, is that if Martha were not there, Mary is more easily interpreted. Lazarus' sister Mary is more easily interpreted to be Mary Magdalene. And then that makes her one central character in the entire Gospel of John. It also means that the person who confesses Jesus as the Christ gets the first appearance of the risen Jesus. Mm-hmm. So it makes her like sort of the central like witness yeah. in, in the Gospel of John. It, it and it makes also her makes important. Super important. I mean, of course, she's important anyway, because he appears to her first on Easter morning. But right now, what I'm saying is, is that the, the addition of Martha basically splits Mary Magdalene into three different women because you get Martha and Mary from Luke's gospel. Because, of course, the name Mary was a very common name at this time. So it's, so I'm saying that, like, Martha and Mary from Luke's gospel might be a totally different family than Lazarus and Mary from John's gospel. But somebody who read Luke and who understood what John was doing, they were like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Like, that's too much. We can't have a woman confessing Jesus as the Christ and then having Jesus appear to her, or we can't have people interpret it that way. So the solution is you source this character, Martha, from Luke's gospel and stick her into John's gospel. And she's a minor character. She confesses Jesus as the Christ. She calls Mary and then she's gone. No more Martha. She's not threatening in any way. So now basically when you bring Martha in, then these characters, Lazarus' sisters, are two different people than Mary Magdalene. They're, so so basically, Mary Magdalene has been fragmented and split into three different characters in the Gospel of John, which diminishes and dilutes her authority. And it makes sure that she cannot be a threat to Peter, who in the other Gospels is the one who confesses Jesus as the Christ. And he never gets the first appearance of the risen Jesus. So... If Mary confesses Jesus is the Christ and gets the first appearance, then she's threatening. Then she can be seen as as authoritative or perhaps for some people more authoritative than Peter. But if you add Martha to the story, the problem is solved because now it's three different women, like lots of different women doing lots of different things. And you don't notice how similar Lazarus' sister Mary is to Mary Magdalene in John's gospel. Because there's a lot of parallels between the Lazarus story and the story between Mary Magdalene and the garden in John's gospel. I get that there's a fragmentation of two Marys, Martha and Mary, but w- what is the third? Well, Mary, it's now it's Mary Magdalene plus Martha and Mary. Got it. From Luke's gospel. So yeah. it's like three different women now. Got as opposed it. That to- other Mary was just like a transient figure. Yeah. I mean, so the question is like, how do you identify Lazarus' sister Mary? Is she the sister of Martha that we know from Luke's gospel? Or is she Mary Magdalene, who we know from John chapter 20? And the addition of Martha like skews it and di- distracts the reader's attention into Luke's gospel. And you're like, Martha and Mary, I love those sisters. They're my favorite. I'm a Martha. My sister's a Mary. And like, because everybody loves the sisters Martha and Mary. And it's a very powerful sort of magnetic decoy that pulls the reader into a totally different gospel with a totally different intention. But what you're saying so, is they're one. I'm saying that Martha and Mary do exist. They're in Luke's gospel. They're in the north. They're a different family than Lazarus and Mary, who are in John's gospel. Got it. And Lazarus's sister Mary is hinted to be Mary Magdalene by the evangelist John. John hints that Lazarus's sister Mary is Mary Magdalene because they are so very similar. And some people say, well, why wouldn't John just like say that Lazarus's sister Mary is Mary Magdalene? And I'm like, maybe because John knew it was controversial to say that Mary was the Christological confessor because John probably had access to Mark's gospel and maybe Matthew's gospel where Peter's the confessor and where the anointing woman is anonymous. 
Okay, so this brings me to a question about the Gospels, period. Weren't sure. they written like 200 years, 300 years in some cases, post death? No, the Gospels this... are written in the first century. At least the canonical Gospels are. Okay, There's so this is going around as, as what people say to like dispute the validity of the Bible. Just this is, I hear this. Are those people PhDs in New Testament from top tier universities? No, no okay. but there's a I'm lot a of... I'm PhD in New Testament from the top tier university. I will tell you that like we have a fragment of the Gospel of John that um, it's like it's slightly older than Papyrus 66, but it's just a fragment. It's called Papyrus 52 and it's dated to the mid second century and it's it was found in Egypt. So um, just it's based on the handwriting, um, but like the, the closest paleographical comparison is second century. So if it had already kind of made its way to Egypt and was being copied, then it was probably, you know, the Gospel of John. Some people say that John was authored at the beginning of the second century. I would disagree with that. But certainly Mark, Matthew were absolutely authored in the first century. Luke and John were a little bit later. Um, but like, absolutely, like these Gospels, they they weren't, um, I would say Mark and Matthew were written around like 70 A.D., Luke and John more like 80s, 90s. That's, okay. that's the traditional dating. And anybody who says otherwise, like you have to look again at like, like, I don't know, Justin Martyr, who's a second century dude, and he knows some gospels. So like you can't, I mean, th those, and also just look at the papyri. I mean, you've got some second century copies of gospels in papyrus that were preserved, that like have survived. So you can't say that they were author. I mean, now the, the Gnostic Gospels, those, most of them were authored later. I would say the Gospel of Thomas could be first century, but most people say second century. Gospel of Thomas is probably the oldest, um, but Gospel of Mary is probably second century, um, not written by Mary Magdalene. Gospel of Mary is not written by Mary Magdalene. Anybody who says otherwise is, again, probably doesn't have a PhD because so, there's nothing Jewish about that Gospel. <laughs> so tell us more about that Gospel. About the Gospel of Mary? Yes, please. No problem. So this one, um, what's so fascinating about the Gospel of Mary is that it was, um, I think it was discovered at the end of the 19th century, but because of a lot of issues like with like a pipe bursting and also with um, wars, it didn't actually get published until 1955. And it was kind of a shock when it came out because the Gospel of Thomas had been discovered. It was also being published in the 1950s. The Nag Hammadi Corpus was being published in the 1950s. And people knew about the Gospel of Thomas because church fathers, those patristic writers that I was telling you about, they talk about the Gospel of Thomas, like Jerome or Origin of Alexandria. They're like, that stupid Gospel of Thomas. Don't pay attention to that Gospel of Thomas. It was obviously a suppressed gospel, but people knew it existed. And then they start to make lists, like in the third or the fourth century, sometimes I don't know, Athanasius or Eusebius, these other church fathers say, don't read these gospels. Like, we do not like these. And then they'll give a list of all the ones that you're not supposed to read. What's very funny about the Gospel of Mary is that nobody ever even mentions that it existed, even though it survives in three different copies. We have two separate Greek fragments of the Gospel of Mary, probably from the third century. And we also have a fifth century nearly complete Coptic copy of the Gospel of Mary, which means not only that it was being widely copied, but that it was also being translated. So it was, um, there's about as many copies of the Gospel of Mary that have been found as the Gospel of Thomas. And they had no problems talking about the Gospel of Thomas and how you shouldn't read that one. But there's some about the Gospel of Mary that they didn't even want, they didn't even acknowledge its existence. So in the 1950s, when it was published, it was a total shock to scholars that there was a gospel written in a woman's name. Um, and again, I'm not, I don't think that it was written by Mary Magdalene. It really seems to be reflecting more platonic and stoic concerns. And some people think it has aspects of Gnosticism, like Gnostic thought in it, if however you want to define Gnosticism, which is another contested issue. But there's nothing Jewish about the Gospel of Mary. So it suggests that it's in more like sort of intellectual Greek circles. And also, um, this might make some people, some of your listeners mad, people who like the Gospel of Mary. And so I apologize to those people. But um, I really, I, I get a little bit annoyed when people anachronistically try to apply the Gospel of Mary to be sort of a, 
a corrective spiritual gospel for today, because it's really like the central question of the gospel of Mary is, will matter be utterly destroyed or not? Is that the question that you talk about on this podcast? Of course not. Like, will matter be destroyed? That is not the question that people today think about. It's because this is like a stoic gospel. It's like it's showing second century intellectual concerns from early intellectual circles. I I do not think of the gospel of Mary as a spiritual cure-all. But what I do think it shows us is that there were debates about women's authority and that Mary was an authoritative figure and that there was conflict around her and her um her sort of closeness to Jesus cuz there's this like scene at the end of the gospel of Mary where Peter and Andrew get mad at her and they basically Levi stands up for her and Mary cries and they they accuse her of sort of lying and then Mary cries and then Levi says if the savior made her worthy who are you to reject her and that to me is actually quite I wouldn't say that it's Like, it's not so much that it's spiritually relevant, it's more historically relevant for me. It's like in the second century, this is not like recording a historical conflict between Jesus, sorry, between Mary and Peter and Andrew. It's it's recording um, conflict between whoever followed Mary and whoever followed Peter and whoever followed Andrew. That like the sort of they were the heroes of um, Mary was sort of the hero of whoever wrote the Gospel of Mary. And um, people had some sort of historical memory that probably the Orthodox Church represented by Peter and Andrew was jealous of her and wanted her to be silent. And that's that's what the Gospel of Mary, from my view, it's saying that this question about women's authority is not like a feminist development. I mean, come on. These conversations were being had in the second century. And Peter was known for being belligerent and aggressive toward her and asking her to be silent. So it's more about Peter and whatever Peter represents than about maybe what Jesus wanted. Maybe Jesus wanted her to have more authority and Peter didn't want that. So to me, that's that's sort of the um, the historical value of the Gospel of Mary. But I know some people find a lot of spiritual value in the Gospel of Mary. And you know what? If you That's fine. You know, I don't find a lot of spiritual value in the Gospel of Mary. And I know that some people do. Uh, and I respect that. Okay, I have so many questions. <laughs> I have so many questions, but I feel like if I ask one, we'll go in one direction. If I ask another, we'll go in another direction. We can ask them both and we can just keep talking and then edit as okay. you see fit. Okay, so I can't quote the scripture perfectly in the Gospel of Mag- Mary Magdalene, but there is something where Jesus is said to say, there is no such thing as sin. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what is that for you? In the Gospel of Mary, um, there are different ways to translate the Coptic. Um, Karen King translates it as there is no such thing as sin, whereas Lant Janot would translate it as sin does not exist. And what goes on after that is that Jesus goes on to say that you produce the sin or um uh, you, you, it is you who commit sin when you do things like adultery, which is called sin. So basically, um, there's more than one way to interpret what Jesus is saying here. I think what Jesus is like, ag- there, again, there's more than one way to interpret it. And I don't want to force my interpretation of the Coptic onto anyone else. I think what is basically going on is that Jesus says that there's no ultimate reality to sin but rather that when you do things like adultery, you create sin. Mm -hmm. So he's not saying that uh, there's like a moral relativism that, you know, that sin is something that that you can do whatever you want. He's not saying like you can just be at liberty to do whatever you want. I think what he's saying is, is that there's no ultimate reality to sin, like there is an ultimate reality to the good. The Gospel of Mary talks a lot about the good and how people should be turning their hearts toward the good, whereas sin is something that doesn't have an ultimate reality. It's something that is created by humans when they do things that um, that they shouldn't be doing. And it basically it also talks about how 
good, which is sort of a, an outside, it's like a, it's a higher truth. It's actually pursuing humans to recall them back to itself. So it's basically saying there's no ultimate reality of sin. I think that that's sort of how that is best interpreted. And I think it's a it's a little tricky. Karen King's translation when she says there is no such thing as sin, that um, that can be taken in ways that are not necessarily in accordance with what the rest of the text says. Well, the other translation was sin does not exist. They mean the same to me. Well, okay. Yeah. I mean, sin, basically, you have to see what Jesus says next. You are what produces sin. I see. I see. I see. But yeah, I get it. So sin doesn't not, sin doesn't innately exist. We, when we're out of alignment with goodness, produce sin. Yes. You're committing sin and you're creating things that um, are getting you away from your root, which is the good. Okay, right. so so this is why the Gospel of Mary Magdalene did have spiritual significance to me. It was that one okay. line because of all of the indoctrination of I'm inherently sinful. That yeah. is my nature. Is okay, sin. okay. Do you see that's so that's oh, why. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so me, this is like, yeah, this is like Augustine's long legacy of like humans are born with original sin and then the Gospel of Mary is countering and saying that that's not your nature, that your nature is good. Yes. Ah, okay. Thank yeah. you. Actually, I appreciate talking to you about that. Um, that shows me how people can get a lot out of the Gospel of Mary in that way. <laughs> okay. So now I have a question. My other question that was emerging a minute ago that it's still very alive is, I imagine, I mean, obviously, in order to learn Greek and you learn Latin and go through all of the time and hours and effort to investigate and really get to the root of who Mary was actually as a as a biblical figure in this great story that has shaped everything, has shaped so much. I want to know what drives you. Like, what is the motivation deeply as a woman, as a, a human soul? That drives you to go to such lengths? Well, you know, some part of that is a little bit of a mystery. You know, I don't actually know, like, why I'm so driven. Um, I think that it really, though, if if I'm being perfectly honest, it's um, devotion. I have a real, uh, I would say, a an active spiritual relationship with the Marys. Um, actually even more so with Mother Mary, both with Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene. And um, I have also done some study of Hinduism in my PhD. And um, there's a lot of discussion in Hinduism of bhakti. Bhakti is uh, basically devotion. You have, yeah, it's devotion. Yeah. And that's sort of the best expression that I can say for my relationship with the Marys. And it's it it's um it's a real driving force worse i i sort of feel like it's so funny because you know i am so sorry to hear what you were saying about like being told that you're inherently sinful and part of the reason that i don't get that is because i was raised in the episcopal church where i was always just taught that god is love and so that doesn't actually that doesn't like harm me because i didn't have that sort of traumatic spiritual upbringing Um, but i do know that there's a lot of aspects of christianity that for many people have been very traumatic and um so I know that sometimes people do have devotion to Jesus within Christianity, I know, and also to the Marys. There's Marian devotion in Christianity as well. But for me, just this idea of bhakti as like almost salvific is something that really resonated with me within the study of Hinduism. I'm like, oh, that's how I feel toward the Marys. And in Christianity also, in the Episcopal Church where I grew up, there's something that they often say, which is to serve you is perfect freedom. And I can see again how some people might be traumatized by that or like being a slave to God. Like a lot of people think that that's horrible and unethical. And I see what they're saying. And at the same time, this for me, it's been very, um, I don't know, generative to say like when you have this bhakti toward, for me, the Marys, like to serve them is perfect freedom for me. That's that's sort of how I feel about it. And 
Um, I, again, I hope I don't like trigger anybody by saying these things, but that's, that's been my experience of it. It's just, um, I, I feel, I feel like I just have a, a commitment to, to the Marys and also of course to Jesus. And in my Magdalene song, I have this line in Latin, which I mispronounced at the time I recorded it because I had no training, <laughs> but the word is ad Jesum per Mariam to Jesus through Mary which is a, a very Catholic line. Um, and it's usually talking about the Virgin Mary, but I, for me, it's through both Marys, to Jesus through Mary. That's how you get to Jesus is you need these Marys as a spiritual bridge to bring you to the place where you could say the balance is found. Um, but you can't, like you, we actually need the Marys to find Jesus. They're a key in actually recovering that um, understanding of God, of the God. So this is why you're on the podcast, because I'm the same. I live in bhakti and devotion to the Marys. Yeah. My whole Yay. life, my whole work, everything is that. That's pretty much what saved my life. And I say the rosary every single day. I say rosary too. Yay. So you yeah, totally get it. You totally, totally get, it. get it. To serve you is perfect freedom. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh my God. It, it helps. <laughs> it helps. I mean, for me, it actually is very mystical and very, you know, n n not what people traditionally think of when they think of Christianity, which is like, you know, I mean, a lot of people think, spiritual people think like Christianity is just this like dogmatic by the book, like, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing that if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. But I find that as I connect with the mother um, and the Marys, in general, it reconnects me to maybe what feels like a, a, this is bold to say, but for me, a more genuine, loving, and perhaps true relationship to the Father. Oh, yeah. yeah. And and that relationship with God being oriented in a healthy way rather than in a misaligned, traumatic way mm -hmm. reorients my relationship to myself and how I see myself. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. I and love that. I I feel like, speaking of traumatizing experiences, I feel like a lot of what we experience and see in this world is religious trauma. I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of it. And I think a lot of people have like completely become atheist or shut themselves out of well, yeah. some connection with the higher power that's living because all of the distortion of the word, you know? And so... It's interesting to me because like how I have found solace is my own interpretation through my more like esoteric prayer and practice to mm -hmm. interpret in my own way and make sense of it in my own way. But what's so interesting about you is you're so literal and that <laughs> and that's also incredibly healing, I'm sure, in its own right. And it, and it feels healing to have this conversation with you because, you know, it also begs it also poses the question for me around like if Jesus the the embodiment of Christ walked the earth if that is true and he had this awareness that wasn't what the t consciousness of the time had which was women are little women are nothing and he actually you know invited this one woman the first to proclaim him to anoint him and then to witness him there wasn't that um, narrative that women are less than, which was so revolutionary, almost too revolutionary, the world couldn't have it. They couldn't handle it. Right. And so it's almost as if we tried to hide that now, especially in this time of women's liberation, like that factual information feels super important. Like what you, what your work and what you're discovering feels super relevant. What I think is a little bit fun about it, and I think God always has a sense of humor, um, is that I'm saying that the Gospel of John itself was a balance on that more patriarchal view. And that um, because, you know, a lot of people would can you can weaponize the New Testament and can use it to sort of make people less than when, in fact, the New Testament is a collection of lots of different voices who sometimes completely disagree with one another. Um, you know, sometimes um, 
Like Revelation 13 says, like, screw the authorities, whereas Romans 13 says, submit to the authorities. I mean, these are two different perspectives. They disagree with one another. Um, or like, I think James says that that uh, you need works to show your faith, whereas there's other parts of scripture in Paul that would say you don't you're justified by faith. You don't need works at all. So Paul and James disagree with one another. And Paul in Romans and uh, John and Re- John of Patmos in Revelation disagree with one another. And I think absolutely the gospel authors also disagree with one another on certain things. It's not always a unified perspective. And I'm saying that John might have had sort of a balancing um, intention in this presentation of this character of Mary Magdalene, which was itself suppressed, fragmented and altered in the course of the transmission of the New Testament. But what I love is that because the Gospel of John was allowed into the canon, it now has the capacity to heal because it was embedded in the center of it from the very beginning. And I'm actually even saying, like for those who really like the Gospel of John, some people hate the Gospel of John and they're like, I love the Gospel of Mary and I hate the Gospel of John. I hate this speaker. Like maybe that's what you're thinking right now. I hope not. But um in the Gospel of John, it says the spirit of truth cannot be received. And it also says that there is no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. And it says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. It says all that stuff. So I'm saying the Gospel of John may have sort of lowered itself to meet Christianity or Peter where it was at at that time. So like the Gospel itself sort of kneels to accommodate our weakness and then that's that's how the gospel of john unlike the gospel of mary was accepted into the canon if the gospel of john had insisted this is mary magdalene she is just as important as peter if there had been that insistence i think this gospel would have gotten chucked and in fact in the second century it was considered a controversial gospel because the gnostics loved it so much i'm saying that the gospel of john might have had to be changed to be accepted into the canon and but the it, but it has like a little uh end game waiting for us there's like a little secret that the gospel of john keeps it's like a seed that gets buried it also says something about that in john chapter 12 unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies it won't bear fruit so i'm saying that the gospel of john see now i'm getting all like christian theology traditional on you and you're like wait what no i'm into like, it keep coming I'm like the gospel of john is like a genius book y'all so it allows itself to be changed and kind of the character of Mary sort of dies, like how she's intended to be presented. But there's a long view here. In fact, in John 11, Jesus says, if you remember me saying earlier, this illness is not unto death, but it is for the glory of God in order to glorify the son through it. Snap. So like there might be an illness in the text. I sometimes call it a wound in the word. The word itself is wounded mm. and it allows itself the the word is vulnerable just as Jesus's body is vulnerable to you could say human sin if you believe in sin or as the gospel of Mary would say, it's something that you create when you do something that is away from your root. So you can look at it either way. But if humans are going to do something to the text, the text allows itself to be vulnerable to that human not goodness in the knowledge that the truth comes out in the end and it the illness in the text might not be for the death of mary magdalene or for the death of women's role in christianity but it could be for the glory of god right like that's how i see so it's super theological and it's actually it makes my mind like go like the gospel of john is a scary book that's like way beyond our understanding and it's got this sort of like Encrypted, yeah, encrypted yeah. and waiting for the time of the feminine. You got it. Yes. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And then it's like, actually, and then then you're like talking, you're not talking about a text that was heretical or a text that was rejected. You're talking about a text that was accepted. And then you're saying God was actually smarter than y'all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I love the Gospel of John. It's like a stealth like getting in under the wire, like, yeah, you can change me. And then when you see the manuscript 2000 years later, you'll see what's actually happening here. And it's super Johannine. It's just the way that John says it. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. And so how are these really brilliant conservative white theologists 
receiving theologians 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 i uh, <laughs> i know it's like geologist theology geology and theology theologians. why is it geology and geologist and yeah anyway you know what I mean. okay anyway theologians <laughs> accepting your 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 thesis you know that's really interesting so um the textual critics are the people who sort of create, like they figure out what the text is supposed to say and they deliver it to the theologians. So they're kind of two different types of biblical scholar. The textual critics, I think, have universally agreed that I have found a problem in the text of the Gospel of John. And in fact, some of the critical editions, the Greek critical editions, are probably going to be updated to reflect this problem around Martha. Wow. Um, Congratulations. Well, that's, trust me, I was just like, whoa <laughs> like when i met i met with these guys in germany who create the critical edition of the new testament so, so you're the woman that corrected the bible i i mean i don't know if i would say it that way because it's not we don't actually have a manuscript where martha's totally gone we just ha i've shown that there's instability around martha which means that we can maybe get some footnotes all right all right we can't we can't you, get like the you, main okay how about this you are a woman devoted to the marys that got guided to see where the wound was that's very nice. Yes, I like that. I like that very much. And I and I do feel that um, I have like a sort of a responsibility. Like I said, like I realized before I started my master's degree, if I don't do this, nobody else is going to. And for some reason, my brain is good at manuscripts and textual criticism. And like I said, 95% of text critics are white dudes. So it's like, okay, I have to do this because I mean, when I was a singer songwriter, trust me, there's lots of singer songwriters in the world. Like, we don't need another female singer songwriter playing her music. I mean, we've got that covered, but it sounds like we do need maybe a female text critic who can ha just bring a different perspective to to these texts. And I would say that um, so the text critics agree that there is a problem. You can interpret it in multiple ways. Um, some people would say, oh, maybe Martha was getting suppressed. And I'm like, I guess, except that we have all this evidence that people thought Mary Magdalene was controversial, like the Gospel of Mary, also the Gospel of Philip and the Pista Sophia and the Gospel of Thomas. There are other documents that show that Peter has a problem with Mary Magdalene and they tell her to be quiet. There, there's there's a lot of independent attestation that Mary was um, controversial, which we don't have for Martha. Um, but when you're asking about the theologians, <clears throat> funnily enough, I get asked to speak at colleges a lot, like in classrooms, New Testament classrooms. And the places I get asked the most are more conservative, like Wheaton College in Illinois or um, Pepperdine University in Malibu and Southern Methodist University, which is in Texas. Those are the people who are asking me to speak in their colleges. And I think it's because these people care deeply about the gospel and what the evangelists wrote. And maybe some of them in their consciences know that there's something off about how women are presented in Christianity or how women's roles have turned out. And so those people are actually the most interested because there's a possibility that John had a different perspective, that John's perspective was changed. And if you can recover maybe a more, they would say egalitarian view mm -hmm. in that John is presenting, then that maybe sits better in their consciences in these academic environments. But then some people would just say, no way, like, just look at First Timothy or First Corinthians 14, 34, and like, it's real clear. And I'm like, well, there's different perspectives on different things in the Bible. Maybe First Timothy had a different view on women's roles than the Gospel of John. Have you ever done the hypothetical thought experiment of what would it have been like if Mary Magdalene hadn't been suppressed in this way? I know what the answer is. It would have gone the way of the Gospel of Mary. It would have so, been lost. It would have been just thrown out. And then we wouldn't have heard a thing about it. Okay, well, yes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm talking like even more. Like what would have happened if Rome and everybody accepted her role. How would the last 2,000 years be different? I think that's a really difficult question because the healing process is slow and not immediate, and it has to play itself out. Um, 
I mean, you're saying what if people had the capacity to receive it? Yeah, but they didn't. And, and, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. But like, I guess what I'm thinking, what I'm attuned to, and I'll just be a little bit more transparent. What I'm attuned to is those who are listening here that grew up in a white parish and are black or who are queer or who was a girl who didn't feel like she had respect and mm -hmm. wasn't honored like all of this Christian trauma that that is beyond actually people who have been in Christianity. I mean, it's we have it in like all the major world religions that are patriarchal. And it also reflects Western culture so much like it's embedded in our value system. It's just everywhere. What what would the world be like if the feminine was revered and respected? What would change? And I, I I'm curious about this question. Not as like a, oh, it could have been, boo-hoo, it could have been, but more of like an exercise of if we reimagine the past, how do we reimagine right now? How do we, how do we like start to embrace and notice what's changing right now and make it and help, help it heal right now? That's my objective, if that makes sense. Well, helping it heal is what I hope to be doing with this work by bringing awareness. I think that the timing is everything. And and I think that sort of depressingly, I don't think humans have been ready for this earlier on. And so it's sort of like, I almost feel like the gospel is waiting for us for a time when we can actually accept and handle it. And um, what's going to happen if, I mean, the way I see it is that by me, if like speaking on podcasts, which I do a lot of, or speaking in college classrooms or giving presentations at churches, which I do all the time. Um, I feel like I'm sort of like tilling the soil to just make people think about it. Like, hmm, like, is this possible that it was changed? And what would really change it is if there was a manuscript that was discovered, an authentic manuscript, not a forgery, an authentic manuscript where Martha was completely absent from the John narrative. And that would create a revolution. That would create a realization that like, okay, like this actually was changed. And it also like affects how people think about the inerrancy of the scripture, which again is not something that's very defensible if you actually look at all of the manuscripts because there's so many changes. Um, I'm trying to get to the heart of your question of how it would change. I actually have a song about this. I wrote a song called Nobody Can See the Seams. And it's from the perspective of the scribe of Papyrus 66 who changed the text. And um, some of the lyrics are, if, if, if I hide it in the seams between the stones, it's something that everybody sees but nobody knows. If you hide it in the seams between like the, like, like the, the manuscripts, if you hide it, it's something that everybody sees. Everybody sees this narrative but nobody knows. What, how, how the seams, like, like, you know, how you've sewed it in a diff, like you've hidden it in the seams. And at the very end of the song, like to, cause I, this is what, this is what you're asking me. Like how, how would it change things? I say, it's the, I say, we all made our own ways. We all made our own ways into this maze. Sorry, I wrote this song. Um, you can see if you, if you open this up, if you open this up, you're going to break it all down. Don't you know if you open this up, you're going to break it all down. It's been a hard, hard red road. It's that red thread we all need to find our way home. It's the unraveling of the rose. Mm. And nobody can see the scenes. So it's it's the opening up of what nobody knows. Nobody knows, but it's the unraveling of the rose. So there's something about the hiding in the seams and then there's something about the blossoming of the rose that it's it's a mystery. We don't know. But there's something about even in the hiding of it in what some would say is the sin or what the gospel of Mary would say is our getting away from the root. There's something even in that that has a bigger design. Mm, I love that. So the rose and the red thread, symbols that have been interpreted to be connected to Mary Magdalene. Can you explain those to us? Mm. 
I mean, I've always loved roses. That was sort it's sort of it's always been my favorite flower and the red thread. Um, you know, I, I love Sarah Beek's book, Red Hot and Holy. And she mm-hmm. talks about the red thread. I think she was actually the first one to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it has connections, not just, I think, with like Japanese uh, mysticism, but also um, Ray- Rahab in the Old Testament. She like ties the, the scarlet thread so that the men can get out of Jericho. So it's also got like Old Testament significance. For me, the red thread that I'm trying to talk about, I mean, I had read Sarah Beek's book when I wrote that lyric. Um, for me, the red thread is about following that path that has been given to me as the bhakti path, which is the Marys are there and I'm committed to them and they show me where to go. Mm-hmm. And that's about finding our way home. And it's it's like literally one little trail at a time. Like you can't see the whole picture. Um, but it is about a sort of, it's like, in, it's also in the manuscripts. It's the red thread of the Maria changed to Martha. It's literally changing one letter. The iota has been changed to a theta in the Greek, Maria, Martha. Like the red thread is like following the trail of manuscript variants throughout the thousands of years of manuscripts. That's the red thread that I am supposed to follow. It's like an ink trail throughout mm-hmm. the papyri and the parchment and the manuscripts. So that is my personal red thread, but that also, I think, does take me back to that time, you know, in the second century when somebody decided to be a jerk. The good news is is that there's there's always a trace. If you're going to change something, it leaves traces. And it's my job to follow those traces and to bring them to you and to everyone who's listening. What's next along the red thread for you? Well, funnily enough, I'm now going to be a professor at a Catholic school, which was like, what? (laughs) That was not expected. Like I I said, I grew up in the Episcopal Church and I got a PhD at Duke, not in the divinity school, but in the religion department. And for whatever reason, Villanova University, they really wanted me to be their New Testament professor. So I am now going to go and work for the Catholic Church. And honestly, I think that part of the reason they hired me is also because there are certain factions in the in the Catholic Church that also are conflicted about the role of women. And in my job talk at Villanova, I raised the question. I said, "So is this thing about, you know, men having this role, women women having this role and women's authority being suppressed, is that the way that Jesus wanted it or is that the way that Peter wanted?" It? Mm. And for whatever reason, that resonated with this Catholic school. And so maybe they think I can make a difference in the Catholic church. I don't know. No. <laughs> so that's, that's where I'm heading next. So I'm like, this is a, I just wrote a song about Mary Magdalene and now I'm a professor at a Catholic school. That is weird. <laughs> well, you're pulling on the red thread. You're just pulling on the red th- thread and it keeps leading you down the red road. <laughs> it is. It is. It has been a hard red road, but it's 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 landing me here. And it's um, what's funny is that the path is you never know where the path is going to take you, but you can always just see one step ahead. So my next step is, OK, you did a good job in the Protestant realm. Maybe you got a critical edition of the New Testament altar, like updated. OK, time to go to the Catholic. So that's fascinating. We'll see what happens next. <laughs> okay, I have two more questions. Sure. This one is for those listening who don't resonate at all with the Christian tradition, don't have it in their background. I, mm-hmm. I just, I have a feeling, especially since you mentioned studying Hinduism and resonating with Bhakti, that you have a really open, welcoming perspective on other traditions. And I'd love to just mm-hmm. hear about that because it's not common. You don't hear about it. That, you know, you know, I, my friend was just talking to me in the car about how he was in a class about the New Testament in school and he asked a question. They were talking about people who don't receive Christ as their savior are going to hell. And he stood up and goes, well, what about the Amazon- Amazonian Indians? And and that teacher said, well, they're going to hell. And then later in his life, he did work with Amazonian Indians. And he's just like, no, that's not that's not the truth. Mm-hmm. And and so. Kind of this, like, I think a lot of people sometimes can't get past the distortion and the hatred that that was used, the the ignorance 
that and how the word has been used as a as a tool of ignorance and suppression. And I think a lot of people can't get past that because, of course, it's done a lot of damage. Yeah. So I would love to hear from you, this person who has gone super deep in this path and lives in that world, your perspective on that and other religions and other ways of relating to the source. Well, I, I did mention that I was raised in the Episcopal Church, which is a pretty chill denomination, honestly. It's, um, as I said, I was I was not given any guilt or blame or hellfire growing up. I was taught over and over and over, God is love, God is love, God is love. And so I don't have any trauma from my Christian religious experience, which I think is honestly part of the reason that I was able to find this stuff, because the trauma actually blocks you from finding things. Like you literally kind of... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? You, um, let me say that again. <clears throat> um, the trauma itself can actually cause you to short circuit in a way that you aren't actually able to find the thing that you're looking for. And I'm very fortunate to have been raised in a denomination that did not give me any trauma. And um, But at the same time, the Episcopal Church um, didn't give me quite what I was looking for when it came to feminine aspects of divinity. And so I was really interested in meditation and Hinduism and in sort of the divine mother aspect of God. And um, that's partly why in my uh, I, I minored in Hinduism in my Ph.D. Because I just wanted to know more about that. And funnily enough, the sort of the Virgin Mary as presented in the Catholic Church always seemed a little bit sterile to me or it just didn't really resonate with me. So I didn't actually go that route, which is where you would think that someone who's looking for sort of a divine mother figure with who came from a Christian background, you'd think that they would go into the Catholic way of doing things. But for whatever reason, I went more into the Hindu side of just like interest in feminine divinity. And oddly enough, that just brought me right back to Mother Mary. And now I do pray the rosary. And actually, when Catholics talk about the Virgin Mary, I'm like, I know her. I'm like, oh, and I'm like, I, I totally get what you're saying. Like the way that Catholics view the Virgin Mary, I actually totally resonate with now. But I had to go from sort of an outside way to get there. And my experience, I guess, of studying Hinduism uh, in an academic way, I I just, again, I, I really am more of a Gospel of John person. And the Gospel of John says that... Um, there was not one thing made, like that the word of God, that there's not one thing made without it. And so if you're actually a true, like if, if I and mean, again, that might offend some of your listeners who are not Christian, but the Gospel of John makes this authority claim that says that Jesus is the incarnate word of God and there was not one thing made without him. Um, and I understand that that again, having studied sort of interreligious dialogue, I know that that is one of the biggest sticking points for a lot of people with Christianity. But I find that as a Christian, it just helps me to say, hey, this entire, um, you know, like all of Buddhism, all of Hinduism, all of indigenous religions, um, if you tr if you do believe this claim being made in the Gospel of John, then you're going to say that is Jesus too. Like whatever Hinduism has to offer. I mean, if you read the Bhagavad Gita, it's like there's so much in there that is like actually pretty compatible with Christianity. Um, and and you can you can see that there's certain aspects of I know what some would say is Christ consciousness that you can actually find in other religions. And I would just say that as a especially my time with the Gospel of John caused me to really commit to this religion. Because maybe because I thought that the Gospel of John was sort of a scary book. I'm like, what is it doing over space and time, like predicting its own corruption? And the word is vulnerable and it's like operating. I see the the gospel, this particular book, not the New Testament, but this book of the New Testament operating on a higher plane than any other sacred scripture that I have encountered. And so I am really committed to Christianity and to Jesus as the um, as the son of God. But at the same time, if you are committed in that way, you have to be open to the possibility that there's pieces hidden in and embedded in those religions that you just as the, there's things in manuscripts that you haven't looked at that you might need. There's things hidden in Hinduism that you haven't looked at that you might need. There's things in Buddhism that you haven't looked at that you might need. There's things in indigenous religion that you haven't looked at that you might need. And um, in fact, I think that's the way that Christianity works. And that, in fact, I think God works, that God always like the thing that you're looking for, the thing that you most need is always hidden 
in the person that you reject. The person that you reject holds the key to the thing that you most need. That is actually how the world operates because the end game is love for everything and everyone. And so if you're going to reject the, the thing that you reject the most fiercely, that person has the thing you most need and you'll never find it until you learn to love that person. That's why I'm always um, talking about the importance of loving Peter. I think that some scholar, women scholars before me, some feminist scholars, um, would have appreciated these text critical problems in those 50 years in between it was first published and when it came out. And I have sensed a lot of vitriol sometimes from those scholars for Peter and for the church, and honestly, understandably so considering the trauma that has been inflicted. And at the same time, you're never going to find it when you have hate toward even the oppressor. You're never going to find it. You actually have to find that love if you want to actually recover the peace that you most need. And it's a really hard, it's a really hard lesson because the trauma is all-encompassing at times. That's just my, that's my understanding of it, that if you hate if you hate your oppressor, you'll never fully understand Mary Magdalene. If you hate the patriarchy, you're not going to understand Mary Magdalene. I think that Mary Magdalene laid her life down for Peter. If you hate Peter, you're never going to be able to find her. Well, that was on brand for us. <laughs> Good. <laughs> we are in agreement. <laughs> we are in agreement. The one the one little nuance, like a semantic, that I want to just like share my interpretation of something you mm -hmm. said that somebody could get hung up on is that Jesus, there's nothing that Jesus didn't create or say, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these other texts that came before the figure we know is Jesus, mm -hmm. is Jesus, but I'm just going to use a different word instead of mm -hmm. Jesus mm -hmm. as one source, call it Christ, call it the one source where it's all encompassed. And that's, I just, a little semantic that I'm going to invite women to embrace if that was a sticky point for them. It's all connected. And I invite that as well. I'm I'm just uh, very much a part of the Christian tradition. And so I'm just, that's sort of my faith commitment. And yeah. um, I, I'm happy to come here and contribute my piece and people can take what they like. I, 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 I know I always come off as like, super conservative and super radical at the same time, which is confusing to people. They're like, wait, I thought she was like a hardcore radical person that said that the Bible was changed. Why is she telling me that the Gospel of John is the thing I should be paying attention to? And I'm like, I'm, I'm no, but I'm actually convinced <laughs> I want to read the Gospel of John now, just like I want to read many different types of texts, you know, and what you said most notably about even even finding love for the oppressor, loving thy enemy to me personally, and this might not be what anybody agrees with, that to me is the the mic drop main message of Christianity. Oh, yeah, for sure. And for it, sure. Un unfortunately, through ego, pride, patriarchy, trauma, etc., humanity distorted that and hated our enemies, <laughs> like just never lived up to that. And not all of Christian Christianity is that. In fact, I would say, I would beg to say the true, uh, the word true Christianity can be debated, <laughs> but... A sincere, humble heart understands that. The humble heart is really important. And I think one other thing that I would nuance if you're saying about loving your oppressor, um, I think that in Christianity, I mean, if also if you look at like womanist theology, which is black women's Christianity, mm -hmm. the cross the cross has often been used as like an excuse for oppressing people and torturing people and um, you know, asking people to just sort of like you know, they told slaves to serve their masters because that's what it says in the New Testament. And if I, I totally think that that is not what Jesus was saying. I think that the key when you're talking about loving your oppressor and even serving those being in service is that it's always the person with more power who serves those who have less power. It's an inversion of the world order. So if you're saying, hey, slaves, serve your masters, like, that's not an inversion of the world order because the person with less power is being made to serve the person with more power. No, that's not what it is. Jesus has more power than the Romans. So when he comes down to be oppressed by them, it's sort of like he's willingly laying that down. And I would say the same thing for Mary Magdalene. 
I think that Mary Magdalene actually has a bit more authority sometimes than Peter. But she is the one with more authority who lowers herself to where Peter is at. That's the key. The person who has more power lowers themselves to the person who needs help. I think Peter needed help. And so here's this Gospel of John, and you can't fully receive it. Okay, we will lower ourselves even a little bit further because that's where you are at, Peter. It's the person who has more power that lowers themselves. And that's, I think, really, really important if you're talking about love of the oppressor. Suffering for its own sake is not good. Like You shouldn't just be like, I'm going to suffer because I can, and this person is abusing me, and I'm going to go there for the sake of being a martyr. I think um, if you are lucky enough to find your life path and your bhakti and to say, like to find this place where you can say to serve you is perfect freedom, then the path makes itself clear which places you have to go to and which ones you don't have to. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Jesus could have, he could have allowed himself to be stoned to death or, and and he's like, no, I'm just going to slip away from that situation. Like there's a lot of times in the gospels where it's like Jesus, they they picked up stones to throw and he just like slipped away. It's not like he's like, oh, I have to suffer to these mean people. No, he the path for him was, I'm going to say all the things that I have to say. I'm going to perform these miracles. I'm going to give my teachings. And then I'm going to go and be crucified by the Romans, by Pontius Pilate, because that's literally, I think that that's like the central critique is of empire and of Caesar in the Gospel of John. And the problem, sometimes people really don't like the Gospel of John because it talks a lot about the Jews and it has been used in a horrible way. And that's probably a problem with the Gospel. But at the same time, I think that the characters, the, the as the Jews are characterized in the Gospel of John, they are the ones who have no king but Caesar. And that is literally what John is critiquing. Those who um, follow empire and you could say capitalism and just worldly things more than God, more than the true God. And so um, when it comes to your oppressor, you have to do it in the path that is like you have to sort of let go and the path will be shown to you. It's like I could have gone and, you know, sort of done intellectual debate with Catholics like a while ago, but that wasn't like five years ago, but that wasn't what my job was at that time. The red thread wasn't leading me there. And now for whatever reason, the red thread's like, I need you to go into the heart of the Catholic church. You're going to be a professor of New Testament at a Catholic university. It's like, okay, like, I guess I'm ready. And and I know that there's going to be times where, first of all, as a woman who is not Catholic and who is interested in women's authority, who is speaking at a Catholic university, there might be times where people get mad and people challenge whatever I have to say. And maybe some people will be abusive. And for whatever reason, this is the time for me to enter that quote unquote unsafe space. Maybe I was not ready before and maybe I'm ready now. I don't know. So I would say that um, it's about finding your your path. You literally have to find the path. And there will be moments where the oppressor might abuse you and it's that's your time to just like allow it and find love for them even in that moment. And then there's times when somebody's being totally toxic and you're just like, eh, I'm going somewhere else. Like, this is not where I'm going to waste my time right now. Right. And you have to watch the path and see where it's taking you. Right. I feel like in the allowing. I, OK, so I read. Do you know who Tao Malachi is? <laughs> Tao Malachi is a Gnostic Tao. He's a Tao. Okay. Um, and he wrote many different books. And he wrote one book on Mary Magdalene that he says were just oral stories passed down. Um, and one of the stories was that she was walking through the woods and she was she was walking through the woods and these man men came to attack her and steal from her and and one got like knocked her down on top of her to rape her and instead of screaming and shouting and trying to push this guy off she opened her heart looked deeply into his eyes and and her like able her ability to truly not have fear for her own safety but have a genuine compassion and concern for this person's sickness and illness um had the man just completely stop shot it shocked him into recognizing his own his own weakness his own pain and he wept in her arms 
And so I think that's what comes to mind as you're speaking. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that story, but it sounds very Mary Magdalene to me. <laughs> Wonderful. So for our last question, and this one I think you'll be able to do quite well, is as a woman here on earth with devotion to the Marys, devotion to the mother, if you could open yourself up to allow for her to speak through you in this moment, what do you think she would have you say to all of us? You have to give me a little time. Um, I think both Marys just want to express love and appreciation for everything that all of you are doing, um, Lauren and Shana, and also everyone who's listening on the podcast, because on some level you're following your intuition, and that in itself for some people has been a radical choice, but also appreciation to being open to not just that intuitive side, but also to the intellectual side, which sometimes the two can merge. Um, that everyone has their piece to offer in the healing. And there's the people who are editing this podcast. There's the people who are hosting the podcast. There's the people who create the invitations. And then there's the people who are listening who are each in their own way doing their own piece of healing. And just to have appreciation for each piece that everyone who is participating in this podcast is contributing and also to recognize that each piece is in its right place and to not just listen to the people who are like you, but also to listen to the other people who have things to offer that are different than yours and recognize that in a healed world that we're each contributing the right thing um, and just gratitude for those who are open to hearing this more technical academic side of things. That's sort of what they sort of were saying just now. <laughs> and then they so. <laughs> okay, we Elizabeth, <laughs> thank you for this riveting conversation. I am thank you, Lauren. Not wait to have more conversations with you. Thank you. Yeah. And oh, I'm gonna be in San Antonio in November. Where are you? I'm in Austin. Okay, well, if you ever want to come to the world's biggest Bible scholar conference, it's in November. There's 10,000 Bible scholars. I, it sounds like totally your crowd, but <laughs> I'll be in San Antonio in November. So maybe, okay, everybody you heard it here. It's called, <laughs> oh, it's the Society of Biblical Literature Annual Meeting. And I will be talking about um, on Tuesday, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, I'm talking about um, a textual variant in Matthew 25 where the 10 virgins go out to meet the bridegroom and the bride. So it's like a different Ooh. version of the story in certain manuscripts of Matthew 20. Super cool. Thank you yeah. for your <laughs> boldness. I appreciate you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Time of the Feminine podcast. It is such an honor every time to be able to host these conversations and to share the stories of the beautiful people we get the opportunity to interview. And so if you enjoyed this podcast, please go ahead and leave us a review. You can do so on Apple Podcasts and write a nice note, or you can do so on Spotify by leaving stars. We so appreciate every single one of you that's taken the effort to go out and to share with others and with our community about how this podcast has touched you. It really means so much to us since for us, this is a labor of love. And so thank you for giving back in that way.